Okay. Uh, welcome to you all to this uh, first session of the seminar series. Uh, at the website which advertised this seminar series, uh, I said uh, this about the talk that I'm about to, to give. I said that in this introductory lecture, I will discuss the importance of language in our private and public communications within the dual perspective of evolution theory and complexity theory. Language is a mental instrument for representing the world, unique to our species, where the evolutionary trajectory began with direct posture over three million years ago. The trajectory accelerated sharply as our social and physical environments became increasingly diverse and complex. It's the single most defining feature of our humanity. Language builds upon and integrates many biological and social behaviors, especially respiration, mastication, remembering, reasoning, and socializing. Language is a complex system with several interacting subsystems, such as phonology, grammar, lexicon, each constantly adapting and self-organizing to meet the needs of our lives. Therefore, research on language must draw from many bodies of knowledge, especially linguistics, cognitive neuroscience, genetics, anthropology, and computer science, as we will see in a moment. Well, that is pushing us, you said. Good. I don't know very much about art, but I really liked this picture. You see, I'm in an EE department, but I'm not an engineer. I'm very uh, slow in picking up these new gadgets. But uh, what struck me about this picture is this little corner here. Gauguin actually adapted some words there in French. Do we know you? Where do we come from? Que sommes nous? Notice he said que instead of qui. Qui sommes nous is who are we? But que sommes nous is what are we? Où allons nous? Where are we going? I think all too often, as our daily lives put pressures on us, we forget the really fundamental questions about humanity. Go again, but the merry one. So, for where do we come from? Science has come a long way since Go again. This is a picture from uh, nature a few years ago, by a geneticist, Sean Carroll. Rather than going through all the details of this diagram, the major stages are simple to remember. 
we're mammals, we're a specific order within mammals, we are primates. And of the primates, some three, four million years ago, a particular <coughs> species emerged called Australopithecus, or Australopithecine. From these emerged a new genus. The genus is called Homo. The genus Homo has many, many species, complicatedly represented in this diagram. We are just one out of the several hundred species. We are Homo sapiens. This diagram also gives us a rough idea about the timing. So here we have 10 million years ago, 10 million years ago, the primates split off. One went in this direction, Pongo. That is the orangutan you find in East Southeast Asia. In Chinese, it's called Hong Xing Xing. A little bit later, after the orangutan, maybe about 8 million years ago, another ape split up. This is the gorilla. A few million years after that, another split took place here. And this leads to us along one path and it leads to two species of chimpanzees on the other path. This was about six million years ago. So our closest living relatives are the chimpanzees. And they themselves split again about two million years ago into two species, the common chimp and the pygmy chimp. The pygmy pimp is also called bonobos. So this is the evolutionary background. And here we can see the dating of various fossils within our genus. So let's see whether we can find uh, Australopithecus here. Here's an Australopithecus. I don't know whether it's readable, but it says Australopithecus afarensis. Afar is a region in Ethiopia where lots of fossils have been discovered. Australopithecus afarensis is a particular set of, particularly famous set of fossils. We'll see in a minute. One of the fossils is called Lucy, a 16-year-old girl. Then you have other homos. Here's Homo erectus. And Homo erectus carry a long time span, including going to Southeast Asia, including going to Beijing. He didn't have a plane to go on, he walked. He walked to Beijing, and we find his remains a few miles southwest of Beijing in a place called Zhou Dian, Beijing Yuanren actually is a Homo erectus. Other Homos, a Neanderthal man, and so on. At any rate, it's a, it's a very complex picture, but this is the outline that seems to be relevant for us. So here's our closest living relative. What are we trying to say with this picture? Not all animals have self-awareness. When you play the movie of your dog on TV and your dog walks by, your dog will not recognize, hey, that's me. When a dog walks by a mirror, chances are he has no self-awareness but chimpanzees do. You let a chimpanzee fall asleep in front of a mirror, you take some paint and paint his ear, 
And he'll wake up and say, that must be me. <laughs> Self-awareness. That's a very important characteristic of the mind. Chimpanzees are also very social animals. Here's a picture of two, two chimpanzees in a European zoo. Chimpanzees like to eat fresh leaves. But if they eat all the fresh leaves, the tree's going to die. So they climb the tree to get at the leaves. But if they keep on clawing, the bark will fall off and the tree will die. So the zookeeper put a little iron fence around this. And here are two chimpanzees looking at all that delicious leaves up there. What do they do? One chimpanzee got hold of a big, long branch. I don't know whether you can see that. Can you see that? Here's the fork of the branch. And holding that branch, the other chimpanzee goes up and brings down the leaves to share. That's cooperation. That takes planning. That takes shared intention. That's a degree of mentality that's actually quite advanced. Only highly developed animals can do this. Another case of a very coordinated food gathering is in the humpback whale. When the whales go after a whole school of herring, one of the whales will dive deep down, let out a lot of bubbles, and a circle of bubbles. The circle of bubbles will trap the herring in, and all of the other whales can feed on the herring. But, they won't. <laughs> they did not. But uh, their theory of mind is of a different order of magnitude than ours. For instance, here's a chimpanzee seeing a banana and begs for it. But if you put a bucket on the head of the human still holding the banana, the chimpanzee will not have the theory of mind to tell it that she cannot see in begging, and therefore it's futile to beg. Children very young know that. But what is, on the, what is the physical basis for all these developments? What is the physical basis of a mind? Well, the closest we can get to the physical basis of a mind is the brain. And here's a comparative picture about the evolution of the brain. So here we have humans and chimpanzees. And as we said a little while back, they diverged about five to seven million years ago. But there's a huge difference in brain size. Not so much in body size, but very much in brain size. The brain volume in humans, in cc's, cubic centimeters, is around 1,400, 1,200 to 16, 17. Some have very small brains, some have very large brains. It's not an indication of intelligence. It's just a matter of individual variation. But it's a relatively large range. Compare this, compare this range of number to the chimpanzee. You can see a huge difference. So let's go back to our human line now. And uh, let's start with this cartoon. <coughs> Again, it's hard to, to, maybe not too easy to see. This guy is still walking on all fours, like chimpanzees do. 
these guys are still walking on all fours. Quadrupedal, four feet, quadrupedal locomotion. But this guy somehow got the brilliant idea. He stood up. He said, hey, look, no hands. That was of world-shaking importance. When Australopithecines stood up three and some million years ago, it set into motion a series of events that led to cultural evolution, language, and human civilization. Some people may probably know about the chaos theory, the father of which is Edward Lorenz. Lorenz once asked the question, does the flap of a butterfly's wings in Brazil set off a tornado in Texas? This question emphasizes the importance of initial conditions. Look how feeble the force is generated by a butterfly's wings. But the feeble, the very, very feeble onset can bring, up, bring about a catastrophic event like a tornado in Texas. Similarly, a seemingly minor change of habit, standing up, erect posture, completely restructured our body. Our larynx has descended. This used to be a straight tube. It used to be a straight tube. Now it's a bent tube. Our hands used to be walk, used to be used for walking. Now it can do all sorts of dexterous things. All sorts of things have been set into motion. Our face, which used to be here, migrated downward. All these change because of erect posture. And when did this happen? Three and a half million years ago. And here's Lucy. Lucy was discovered, her fossils were discovered in a region of Ethiopia called Afar. And uh, it was amazing because such a complete fossil that far back are uh, very, very rare indeed. But here, here is the full set of bones left behind by this young girl in Ethiopia 3.4, 3.5 million years ago. And by a very careful study of her joints, of her foot especially, of her pelvis and so on, you can reconstruct a skeletal structure like that. Fully erect walking walking and running. That alone may not lead to a very firm conclusion, but very luckily, not very far from where Lucy was discovered, of a whole series of footprints were discovered. These footprints have been preserved because there, were, there was a volcanic eruption nearby and a volcanic ash covered the footprints. And when they recovered it, they can see that there were two adults, one child, and careful measurements like this one by Mary Leakey, a very famous anthropologist, shows that Lucy was a fully erect, bipedal Australopithecus. And science is a persistent and cumulative effort. Even though these discoveries were made decades ago, still not. Here's science just a couple of years ago, still doing all sorts of modeling and so on. Turns out the hand, of course, is so important to us. But the foot is also has a very fine and subtle structure. 
What about the heads? Well, we talked about Beijing Yuanren, Homo erectus, and here's a cast of Homo erectus. How would you compare a head like this with a modern head? Well, one very big, big difference is that our heads, our foreheads, are essentially vertical, close to vertical. Whereas Zhang San over here <laughs> had a head that's very slanted, reducing the cranial volume by a big margin. Another difference is that there was these heavy brow ridges. Another difference is that there's a big snout, a big snout. The big snout obviously was correlated with a very good sense of smell. But in modern people, this has reduced, this has atrophy, and our sense of smell does not compare anywhere as close to other animals. So this was about half a million years ago. A couple of hundred thousand years after that, near Shanxi, near Xi'an, there's a place called Tal. And another skull was discovered, Homo. And again, you see a heavy brow ridge, sloping back of the head. But here, the maxilla, the upper jaw, has retracted so. So these are all Homos, but not anatomically modern Homos. Sometimes we abbreviate, abbreviate AMH, anatomically modern humans. By which I mean, if somebody like that walks in here, we will not jump out of our seat. We will take it home. It's just stress funny. But uh, these are anatomically modern humans. Notice the forehead. Notice the re retraction of the snout. Notice the much larger brain case and so on. These date back to 150, 160 years before present. And they were discovered just about a decade ago. These are the oldest anatomically modern. And discoveries are still being made. You, you can never get, tell when you build a new factory or dig a new ditch, you'll come across some new fossils. The richest find here recently <coughs> was in Georgia. Georgia in Central Asia, not Georgia in Southeast United States. This place is called Manisi. <coughs> and here's a modern, Homo sapiens, slightly different looking from what we are used to, used, uh, what we're used to seeing. But this was discovered just a few years ago and reported in science just last year. I, I like to see these things because they remind us that science is an ongoing effort. You don't say, ah, oh, now I I understand this. This is the conclusion. This is the last word. There's no such thing as science. Science is always progressive. Depending on the latest set of data, you come up with the best possible hypothesis. So to summarize a little bit then of what I've been saying, about three and a half million years ago, we achieved erect posture. And about two million years ago, the erect posture, making possible hands, allowed us to make tools, stone tools. With the making of stone tools that persist, a new step, a new, a new plateau, <coughs> We've reached a new level of activity. 
And uh, <coughs> that new level of effectivity we might call cultural evolution. Before that, evolution primarily took place biologically. Your parents shared their genes, they passed down to you. You marry somebody else, you share a gene, that passes on. Only genetic. But with cultural evolution, things that you learn, which are outside of the body, you can, you can pass on. And that's a much, much more powerful medium of transmission. Other animals have certain degrees of culture too. For instance, chimpanzees across uh, northern Africa, troop to troop to troop, have different cultural ways of fishing for termites. That's culturally transmitted because the time of variation is too short. But it's only in us, we're the only species that has a, such a powerful mode of transmission in terms of cultural transmission, cultural evolution. So in this way, we are different from all other forms of life. There have been millions and millions and millions of forms of life since life began on this planet. But we're unique. We're the only one that has harnessed cultural evolution. <clears throat> And a primary reason that we've been able to do this, the key to this advance is language. Why didn't the other species colonize the whole world? Why weren't they able to cross certain oceans? Why weren't they able to uh, build, for instance, the way we do? One answer that scientists often give on this is that it's because we had language, language of uh, a much more advanced form, language probably something like 100,000 years ago. So here's a remark from a very famous philosopher, Wittgenstein, said the limits of my language are the limits of my world. probably not completely true. There are probably things that you can think about that you cannot express in language. But I think it's largely uh, undeniable. A famous linguist, Edward Sapir, said, the real world, what is the real world? What is this thing out here? Is it just the stimuli on my sensory organs? No. Cognitive neuroscience has made it very clear over the last several decades that the things that we see, we hear, we feel, quite often only have an indirect relationship to the actual stimuli. Our brain is constantly reconstructing, interpreting Millions of bits of information are going from your retina to your brain. But by the time it reaches the brain, the, re the, the part of the brain that actually interprets this, you're dealing with a very, very small fraction of that or original raw information. And how do you discard? What kind of information do you use? What kind of information you don't use? Well, depends on your brain. This is why Sabir said, the real world is to a large extent unconsciously built up on the language habits of people. And to get one more quote, here's a geneticist who won the Nobel Prize in 1965, a Frenchman called Francois Jacob. Jacob said, we mold our reality with our words in our senses, in the same way as we mold it with our vision and our hearing. And the versatility of human language also makes it a unique tool 
for the development of the imagination. I think the se second sentence is very important too. With language, we can get in touch with the remote past. Confucius died 2,500 years ago. We can read his stuff. We can imagine what it might be like. You know, if global warming keeps up, what's going to happen to the planet? We can we cross the boundaries of time, we cross the boundaries of space with our imagination. And imagination, the engine for imagination is our language. Well, once we have language, how come it started getting so different from each other? Well, you, some of you probably uh, know this uh, story from the Bible, from the book of Genesis. Okay? Uh, people were building this tower, Tower of Babel, and uh, they built higher and higher and higher, thinking that they can reach the heavens. And the book of Genesis says, go to. Let us go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. They're not going to get that powerful. They're not going to get to heaven. Let's make it poss impossible for them to understand each other. Well, this being the case, how many languages do you think we have now? Anybody has a guess? <laughs> I'm reminded uh, of the first class I had in linguistics a long, long time ago at Columbia University. A professor came in and said uh, he had a five beta cup of tea. A very proud gentleman, Portuguese. And he said, ladies and gentlemen, there are 3,974 languages in the world today. <laughs> and everybody said, wow, how did you know that? He, of course, didn't know that. <laughs> and of course, we don't know. Because the boundary from language to language is very fluctuating. But in order to have some kind of a convenient figure to work with, uh, linguists typically say it's between five and seven thousand languages. It's a lot of languages. What about the people who speak them? Where did they all come from? Well, this is a classic diagram. It was actually done by uh, uh, the author was actually a graduate student at the University of California at Berkeley when I was teaching there. Her name is Becky Kahn. And she went and collected DNA from maternity wards in Berkeley, Oakland, and San Francisco. Because within the placenta, you can get a type of DNA called mitochondrial DNA, mtDNA. Mitochondrial DNA is interesting because it's unique parental. It goes down only the mother's line. It does not get confused with the father's genes within the mitochondria. So the next thing she did was to analyze the DNA she got from all these women. There were, I think, 130, 140 women. She measured how close their DNA are to each other and constructed a family tree. I wonder whether you can tell that this is actually a tree. It's, it's been deformed to fit into a page, but here's the root. This is the ancestral mother of all of these. Here's the first branching. Next branching, next branching, and so on. It's a root. 
Am I doing something bad? <laughs> Because it's uniparental, she was able to construct a tree with just one root. And then she put those which are closer together, lower on the tree, those which are farther apart, higher up on the tree. There are two messages from this tree. One is that if you take these women and classify them according to their ethnic group, it turns out that the very first split were all Africans. There are Africans elsewhere too, but the first split were all Africans. This is the original impetus for the so-called out of Africa hypothesis. Otherwise, how would you explain this distribution? The other lesson from this tree is that if you assume that mitochondria mutate at a somewhat constant rate, then you can compute what is the time difference between these women and the original ancestor. And she did that. It's over 100,000 years ago. So this study, plus several studies later, following the same logic, but not using mitochondrial DNA that go from mothers to daughters, but using the Y chromosome, which go from fathers to sons, which is also uniparental then the two sets of genetic data converged very nicely. Therefore, you have a lot of converts to this idea of out of Africa. We all came out of Africa. Not yesterday, not a hundred years ago, but a hundred thousand years ago. This is the out of Africa. When, the first, when this hypothesis first came out, everybody was uh, so shocked. You know, I don't look African. <laughs> but things like that you know, can change in just a few generations. Uh, but there is room for doubt, I think. Because when these people came out, these anatomically modern humans came out of Africa, there were already all sorts of people around in Europe, in Asia, Southeast Asia, and so on. Did they just completely get wiped out? Or were there some good looking ones that left their genes behind too? I think the story is more and more people are believing that there was intermixing but not a very significant extent. But there was definitely intermixing. This has been established for sure with Neanderthals. And people are looking at other possibilities. The exciting frontier is that people can actually take a piece of fossil, 100,000 years old, and if lucky, extract DNA from it. This is called ancient DNA cell. So it's from Rebecca Kahn's study and the Y chromosome studies that followed and so on, plus all sorts of other evidence, okay, that uh, a few years ago, uh, 
uh, hypothesis was put forth by two people at, at Stanford, Cavalli Sforza and Mark Feldman. And this is what they claim. The out of Africa hypothesis anatomically modern humans left Africa about 100,000 years ago. They crossed into Australia about 50,000 years ago. They crossed the Bering Strait, went into the Americas uh, as recently as 115,000 years ago. Uh, we might say, you know, how, how are they going to walk this? But of course, land was very different then. As the temperature gets cold, a lot of the water gets locked up in glaciers. The sea level drops 10 meters, 20 meters, 30 meters. And you can really just walk across along the glaciers. So the received understanding for the population of China is probably we came across in two waves. There's a southern wave and there's a northern wave. This shows up in our skeletal structure. This shows up in our DNA. And this shows up still a little bit in our cultural habits, in our food preference, for instance. Language-wise, down here you have the ostrich ones. You have Austronesian. Austronesian eventually got, well, bottlenecked here in Taiwan. You have Austroasiatic, which is distributed all over Southeast Asia, many parts of India, including Thai, for instance, Vietnamese, these are Austroasiatic. You have Tibeto-Burman. Tibeto-Burman, uh, the, the family is named after two with long literatures, Tibetan, and Burmese, and Tibeto-Burman and Chinese together is named Sino-Tibetan. We speak Sino-Tibetan languages. Uh, the, all of the Chinese dialects, Wu, Xiang, Ming, Ke, Jia, Kan, these are all Tibetan, sino Sinetic, Sino-Tibetan. What is the basis of my telling you all this? How do I know this? Well, linguists have actually been working on this for well over 100 years. The person who started this type of research was an Englishman. He was a jurist from London. They sent him from London to India, to Calcutta. And at that time, there wasn't much linguistics. But Jones was a real lover of languages. Even though he, his practice was law, he studied Persian, he studied Greek, he studied Latin. He actually wrote a grammar book for Persian. So by the time he went to Calcutta, he said, gee, here's a chance for me to study Sanskrit, which is the liturgical language of India. And he studied Sanskrit, and the more he learned about Sanskrit, the more convinced he was that even though this is in far away <coughs> India, spoken by people who look very, very different from the average in the, in the average in Europeans, okay, these are people who are relatively smaller, darker, but their language is related. So the migration must have taken place very early. Many of the traces are no longer left, but he said, they all speak a language bearing a stronger affinity, more like each other, than could possibly have been produced by accident. That is, it cannot be the null hypothesis. This is definitely something to be explained. And, uh, his, his explanation is that they all sprung from some common source. They all want the same language, which no longer exists. 
and this was the, this was this was the real beginning of modern linguistics. Modern linguistics got launched by that one paragraph. After this, for well over a hundred years, many brilliant minds used this and reconstructed this language which no longer exists, and that's called Proto-Indo-European. And for many decades now, people have been trying to reconstruct Proto-Sino-Tibetan. We're not nearly as far along as Proto-Indo-European, but it's the same type of endeavor. <clears throat> here's some examples. Here's, uh, here's some numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And uh, look at two. Two in English is two. It's not spelt right, is it? Nobody says two. But uh, in Russian, two is dva. The V corresponds to the W. Uh, in Gothic, it's a dead language now, it's twi. Uh, in Latin, it's duo. In Greek, it's duo. In Sanskrit, it's la. So in the V, W, reflected in the English W, which is no longer pronounced. But the thing to, to, to notice is that there's a correspondence. Whenever you have a T in English, in these languages, you have a D. And whenever you have a th in this language, in these languages you have a you have a t. So d becomes a t, t becomes a f. V becomes a p, p becomes a f. G becomes a k, k becomes a h. Perfectly regular. Of course, we're separated by many thousands of years. You don't have a lot of words for documents. But the regularity is striking, could not be due to chance. Father. What is it in Latin? Pater. P to F. Foot. F. When you step on a bicycle, pedal. Pedal has a suffix O. <coughs> the root is ped. In ped and foot, the P corresponds to the F, the D corresponds to a T. Could that be due to chance? So, <clears throat> once this was revealed to linguists, this became kind of a cornerstone for doing research that says, yes, this language is related to this, this language is not related to that, according to such correspondences. Here's something that we are more familiar with. Here's one, six, five, six, seven. In our case, we have an additional feature to take care of, and that is we speak in tones. Okay? So, tones were discovered primarily as the result of impact from Sanskrit when Buddhism went into China at the end of the Donghan dynasty. So there were a bunch of poets, especially during Nanbei Chao, who said there seems to be four tones. Let's call these Ping, Shang, Chu, Ru. That's over 1,600 years ago. Ping, Shang, Chu, Ru do not correspond to the Ma, 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 we have today. Okay. But we can set up correspondences. So, for instance, uh, <coughs> corresponds to Cantonese, Hong Kong Cantonese, yeah. Corresponds to Shanghai Hua, yeah. Corresponds to Taiwan, Minan, Zip. Oh, Zip should have a low cost. Minai is strange in that way. What should be high is low, and what should be low is high for the Russian. 
and just for comparison, Japanese. Japanese is not Japanese is not Sino-Tibetan, but under many centuries of Chinese influence, many many words borrowed, the writing system got borrowed, and so on. So you can actually take words early borrowed into Japanese and compare them to Chinese. But the Japanese language itself is Altaic; it's not Sino-Tibetan. So in Japanese, it's Ichi. R becomes ni. Okay. You can see from this column that people in Hong Kong are lucky. They speak a very conservative language, allowing them to have a better glimpse of the language of the past. So for instance, when uh, Li Bai and Du Fu were writing their poems, their syllables had an M at the end. This M got merged with an N. So in Cantonese, there's still a distinction between San and San. You only have San in the right one. Furthermore, in some other dialects, for instance, Taiwan Minhan, the N has gotten lost. But the N did not just go away quietly, it left a little trace of nasalization. So it's san, an, an. You have this all over French, right? Lots of things in the end you don't pronounce anymore. And if it's an M or N or NT and so on, you pronounce nasalize the vowel. Then fini is to finish. But you take away the suffix, you have fan, fan, which is nasalized. Right? So here you have the whole trajectory. You start with an N, it becomes an N, N becomes lost, it's alive, and nasalization gets lost. So in Shanghai, all you have to say, se, in yi se. Uh, I don't want to go into this degree of detail now because uh, I want to finish soon, but I want, I want you to get a feel for the excitement of language. We uh, speak almost as easily as we breathe, but how much do we know about respiration? How much do we know about language? There's a lot of really fascinating stuff about language. Anyway, following Jones, now we have a very complete picture of Indo-European. This was uh, published in Science in 2004. <coughs> So, uh, here's the English. This is the English we speak now. This is the English of Chaucer's time. This is the English of King Alfred's time. This is a reconstructed entity called West Germanic, as distinct from North Germanic, which are Danish, Norwegian, and things like that. And these trace back to Germanic, which gets back to Korean. Way out here, you have two languages called Tocharian. Anybody know where Tocharian is spoken? Probably in Western China, in Xinjiang. A few years ago, they discovered some mummies in the Tarim Basin, Xinjiang, by clothing, by leftover tablets, and so on. It's an Indo-European language. Uh, Okay, what I plan to do now is to go over a few maps and then jump to my last slide. The point of the <coughs> seminar is to relate language to field work and to cognitive neuroscience. Okay. Uh, I decided to cover these materials because they provide good background for what my colleagues will talk about. Okay. So I do not feel very badly. 
about leaving out some of the things uh, that I have in the slides. So here then is uh, a family higher than the in the European family called the Eurasianic family. Here's uh, another family called Dene Caucasian family. I want to call these two super families to your attention the most because English is in the Eurasiatic family and Chinese is in the Dene Caucasian family. So here's the Dene Caucasian family that probably got covered over by the late conquering Indo-Europeans. So it leaves blotches here, blotches there. One blotch that's left, for instance, is between France and Spain. That language is called Basque, and many people believe that's related to Chinese. Another language is Yeniseyan. There's a river here running into the Arctic Ocean called the Yenisei River. Unfortunately, there are just about a couple of thousand people left in this whole language family. Nonetheless, uh, they, they are related to us. And uh, finally, of course, many of the people that crossed over to the Americans are related to us. The relation, of course, is not only in language, but also in genes. And because of our genetic affinity, we look alike. So when I first went to the United States many, many years ago, people who have, who have not been around much would come to me and say, uh, pardon me, which tribe are you from? <laughs> <laughs> are you Navajo or are you Apache? <laughs> Languages, of course, differ a lot in how they structure their words. Uh, in, in our case, we just have the word so, and he so, what so, ta so, woman so, ming tian so, hou tian so, zuo tian so. It's just so. But if you were speaking Italian, you got to really watch all these suffixes. If it's first person singular, present indicative, it's a camino, suffix o. Second person singular, camini, camini, camina, nero, nerai, nera, ayamo, ate, ano, eremo, erete. You know, it, it drives you crazy after you remember all this. When Westerners first looked at the Chinese grammar, they say, you know, they, these people must not be very precise because they can't even make all these distinctions. That's the question that to ask is, do you need to make all these distinctions? Why can't you say, so? What are the relative merits of a heavily inflected system versus a simple inflected system? Without being judgmental at the beginning, say, ah, they must be wrong. I think it's an issue well worth exploring. If you save some energy here, you have more energy for something else, right? That, that was for verbs. Now here's something for nouns. Okay? In Italian, there's a uh, you have to differentiate a noun depending on whether it's masculine or feminine, singular or plural. <coughs> if it's masculine singular, boy, it's ragazzo. But if it's feminine, a girl, it's ragazza. Plural boys, ragazzi. Plural girls, ragazze. But that's only two numbers. 
In Russian, you have three numbers. So, for instance, if, if you want to say in Russian, I have a book, you say, at me, there exists. Okay, lots of languages indicate possession this way. Not a possessive name verb, but a preposition at me, there is. One book. Book is knik. This is a Cyrillic writing, so if it doesn't look familiar, it's okay. Umenya jest adna kniga. At me, there is one book. But three books is umenya jest three knigi. A and E are different. This is singular, this is plural. Above four, we get into the real plural, and you say, Umenya jest piat knik. Now, this is, of course, one type of complexity. Here's another type. Here's a language called Swahili that you find in uh, Northeast Africa. There, instead of feminine, masculine, neuter, you have six classes of these. <clears throat> so for instance, person is a class one man. In Swahili, it's two. But the problem, the difficulty is, once you select a class of noun, the entire remainder of the sentence is conditioned by that selection. So do you, in order to say one good person, or that one good person fell down, which is the syntax of Swahili, once you choose tu, which is person, class one, Two takes a prefix which is in, instead of boys, which is a suffix, in Swahili, plural is a prefix. It's nitu. If you want to say uh, several, you say it's watu. It's a prefix rather than suffix. And once you choose a class, you have to, you have to sprinkle it all over. You have to say, nitu mzuri mboja yule amen ka. All these have to do in class one. And if you add a person and it becomes plural, all of these M's have to be replaced. It becomes Watu Wasuri Wabili Male Wame Kuka. In the past, linguistics has been too focused on European languages. And if it's not like English, it's probably some kind of aberration. That's a terrible attitude. There's great like, linguistic diversity in the world. There's great linguistic diversity in Greater China. And we have to know the extent of this diversity. So another class would be class four, which takes a key. Um, that basket is class four. And of course, languages are frequently coming into contact. Uh, I have a friend at Nankai University, or Atsuo, okay? and Atsuo uh, studies a language in Sichuan called Daohua. And some of the ex ex examples he gives are just really fascinating. Instead of saying, in Daohua, this is not for show, this is not a game, they actually talk like that. What they say is, instead of saying, Daohua is, Fan Shi Ren Ge Yu Lei. Okay, this is the last uh, topic I will give you. Uh, the Daohua is an example of Tibetan coming into contact with uh, Putonghua. But uh, that's still within Greater China. 
What about when Chinese is transported away from China? Well, according to the history books, there was a huge Muslim rebellion during the middle of the Qing Dynasty. And these people tried to over, overthrow the Manchus. And the Manchus were having a very tough time for a long time. And they finally went to Hunan and enlisted the help of Fu Zong Tang, who was a great general. So Fu Zong Tang marshaled a lot of forces, beat the Muslims, drove them out, out of Xinjiang, across Tianshan, into the, the place now called Kyrgyzstan. So some years back, I heard about these people. They're called Spong guys. What do they speak? How are they getting along? What's their culture like? So after some difficulty, I was able to track them down in, uh, in uh, Kyrgyzstan. And um, I went to the Academy of Science, talked to their scholars there, and uh, one of the biologists there said, you know, we are still keeping up with the language. He refused to call it the dialect of Chinese. So it's like, you get very bitter feelings for China from the military and Congress. But the language somehow is kept alive. And here's a textbook for the language. And this, this book, you know, as you saw earlier, is written in Cyrillic. It says, Hui Zhu Yuan. Hui Zhu Yuan. And the author is Imasa. So I took this. It was a treasure for me because I had a very difficult time finding these people. I took this home and studied it, looked at the vocabulary and so on. And here's one of my favorite stories. Okay, I will simply tell you that this is a story by Tolstoy. Leon Nikolaevich Tolstoy. And the name of this story is Liang Ge Liang Shu. And it tells us the Tolstoy story about two friends being chased by a bear, okay, and they couldn't run fast enough. One lied down and played dead, and so on. So that's what this is about. But it's written in Cyrillic, and it's in the Donggan phonology. In Donggan phonology, one of the strange things, for instance, uh, what we call Juan Shiyin, retroflexes, have all become labial dentals. So we say Shu, Iko Shu, it was a Fu. So Yang Liang Shu is a Fu Lin Li, Zhu Zhe Zhu Zhe. This is Fu. This is the Russian of Cyrillic. Okay, I, I want to come to my last slide. As you can see, there's so much I want to tell you. <laughs> but this, most of all, I want to tell you. Oh, the, the slide before this was written by a bunch of scientists with the title, Not All People Are Weird. Where weird means Western, educated, rich, democratic, namely <coughs> Europeans. So much of the scientific knowledge we have about people are based on these weird people. Experiments done in Britain, experiments done in North America, Canada, and so on. Does that apply to us as well? Surely a small amount, but not for people. So this is why I feel so strongly that uh, we have a center that we perhaps can do some restoration of a balanced perspective on human beings. Because we're human beings too. In fact, we're a very large part of humanity. So this is what I wanted to tell you. 
toward a more balanced view of humanity from the perspective of greater China, we can contribute to future research in two important ways. We must achieve a fuller understanding of the linguistic diversity in our part of the world, especially in the non-urban regions. I don't mean Beijing, Shanghai, Xiamen, Xiangang, Guangzhou. <coughs> China is much larger than that. China is a lot more diverse than that. Especially in the non-urban regions. We must pay special attention to features not commonly found in European languages and cultures. These include the lexical use of tones, a rich system of classifiers, Tones probably have been with us for 3,000 years. Classifiers probably less than 2,000. We did not make charts for Relatively simple morphology compared to Italian and Russian that we just saw. And writing in thousands of silent words, Hanzi. People have always been criticizing Hanzi, not realizing that there are very special advantages of this type of language. Currently, disciplinary boundaries are often too rigid. Transdisciplinary research is scarce. And it's difficult to make connections among bodies of knowledge. We must break down such boundaries and effectively connect the first-hand data collected from the field with the experimental results obtained in a laboratory for the light that combined views can shed on the nature of our species as a whole. Investigating where we come from, what we are, where we are going, the questions posed by Gauguin in the early slide that I showed you. As a unique species in this known universe, is a grand challenge answering these questions that our Joint Center has committed to do. We hope that many young people will be excited by these questions and join us in this fundamental quest. <laughs>